All right, well, let's go ahead and get started uh, as people trickle in and have lunch. Uh, I'm Stephen Ezell. I'm the Vice President of Global Innovation Policy here at ITIF. And we're just absolutely delighted to have with us this afternoon Dr. Derek Chung uh, here to discuss his book, Conquering the Electron, the Geniuses, Visionaries, Egomanics, and Scoundrels Who Built Our Digital Age. And Derek, I have to say, I just found this to be a tremendously engrossing, highly readable, page-turning book uh, that really enlightened me greatly on the technical history of the electronics revolution uh, that has led, as you say, uh, to the greatest sustained period of wealth creation in all of human history. Uh, the book draws out important insights across a range of important subjects from the nature of scientific discovery and innovation the characteristics of entrepreneurs and innovators, and the role of intellectual property in public policy and government in supporting the scientific research and through the adoption of these technologies that become so important to their mass adoption. Uh, it's, it's truly a fantastic book, and I commend it uh, to all of you and to others. Uh, my uh, in-laws were in town over the Easter break, and they were intrigued uh, by what I was reading. Uh, my father-in-law is an engineer from Detroit, so. Uh, uh, he and his wife have, uh, have a copy uh, sent to them, and my wife got a copy as well, so uh, I, I, I commit it to you all. Um, what we'll do today is we'll have Derek uh, present his book for about 35 minutes, uh, then we'll invite John Newfer, uh, the president and CEO of the Cement Network Industry Association, to provide a few minutes of commentary. Uh, then we'll have a brief moderated Q&A session before turning it over to the audience uh, for your questions. So with that, let me go ahead and introduce our two panelists. First, uh, Dr. Derek Chuan is a scientist turned businessman with a lifetime of experience in science and technology. He cut his teeth in the industry as a research engineer for the legendary Fairchild Semiconductor before moving on to become vice president of research at Rockwell International and then president and CEO of the Rockwell Scientific Company a for-profit corporate research lab spun out of Rockwell International. Uh, Derek retired in 2007 to focus on R&D transition strategies and founded the Institute for Technology Advancement, ITA, at UCLA to implement such concepts, uh, which led, as I understand, to the launch of several successful startups out of UCLA. Setting out to write a book on the history of mankind's efforts to harness the power of the electron and electromagnetic waves, uh, he released Conquering the Electron in Chinese in 2011, which was awarded the Golden Bookmark Prize as the best original Chinese language popular scientific book. Uh, this English language version, uh, co-authored with Eric Brock, came out in uh, 2014, and the book has subsequently also been translated into Korean and Japanese. Uh, and after Derek, we'll hear briefly from uh, John Newbert. As I said, uh, John is the CEO of the Semiconductor Industry Association. And before that, he had been here in the building as a senior VP for global policy at ITI, and before that, with the U.S. Trade Representative's Office for a number of years, uh, working on uh, Asia Pacific trade issues. Uh, so, with that, uh, Derek, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen, for a nice introduction. Thanks to everybody to come and listen to me. And also, there are people watching the live streaming. And my daughter and my son-in-law, they're, they're high. <laughs> uh, very happy to be here to talk about uh, the history of how humankind, human race, uh, conquered the electron. It's a fascinating story. Many of the books talk about individual inventions. And what I'm trying to do is to see the vertical linkage between those events and using kind of a modern value to look at the whole process. Uh, I will briefly talk about the history, which is very long and complicated, and I will talk from the technology and business point of view, as opposed to a more uh, academic, historian kind of uh, approach. And that's additional perspective from this point. And also, I will focus on communication and information. So I will not talk about uh, Edison, Tesla, with that level of At the end, I will say a few words about lessons learned from the history that reflects in today's situation. And 
of some concluding uh, remarks. So I talk about 200 years of scientific uh, innovation and invention in electronics. But actually, it goes much longer than that. About 3,000 years ago, the Greek already had reported a strange phenomenon. When you rub a piece of dry cloth on a piece of amber, you find there's a mysterious force. When you pull it close to your hand, your hair will stand up. And we all talk, know that's electrostatics. Uh, and then about 400 years later, they find a stone in a village that can attract uh, rocks with a very high iron content. So it's called a magnet because the name of the village is called magnesium. And the Chinese uh, discovered a magnet independently over 2,000 years ago, and they developed that into an application, compass. You find that when you rotate the spoon, which is very magnetic, when it comes to rest, it will align with the uh, north-south direction. And this compass technology evolved for many years and got into, into Europe through Arab, Arabs in the uh, 14th century. But the real work for electron, uh, for electron uh, magnetism did not start until 1600 by a uh, British scientist, William Gilbert, who's one of the key figures in the Renaissance age, about the same time as Galileo. And he began to use scientific method to understand the nature behind electricity and magnetism. And he did a lot of experiments, and he even uh, postured that the Earth is a big magnet itself with the north and south pole coincide with the uh, poles of the Earth. That's why the compass will align itself. So at that time, that kind of concept is really incredible. He also has credit to coin the word electron. It's a Greek word. It means ember. So when you talk about electronics, remember ember. And after uh, Gilbert's work, scientific work begin to gradually uh, germinate. In 1745, the Dutch professor discovered a glass jar. He put metal films inside and outside of the glass, uh, separate from each other. And you can store electronic uh, static charge in this bottle and carry that anywhere you want. And when you short the two plates, you get a spark and you get a shock. So people have been using those uh, bottles to experience uh, a shock here. And our incredible genius, Benjamin Franklin, when he saw this spark, and he began to associate that with lightning in the sky. It's just uh, the spark from the Leyden jar is a miniaturized part like a lightning. So that made him to think, maybe lightning is caused by discharging of electrostatic charges in the clouds. So he did the experiment of flying the kite into the clouds and replaced the string with a piece of uh, uh, conductive copper wire. And he's able to charge a discharged Leyden jar with electricity pumped on the head. Incredible genius. Uh, but all that static electricity thing did not go very far because things are not reproducible, uh, hot control. The real breakthrough in electronic research starts in 1800 by a professor in uh, northern Italy <coughs> by the name of Alexandro Volta. Volt, we all know how many volts uh, that came from. Him. He has this great uh, this invention to the right of that picture. What is that? That's a battery, the first battery. It has disks of silver and zinc stacking together. But in between them, there's a piece of cardboard soaked in uh, with uh, salt water. So by stacking those things together and con connecting a copper ribbon to both sides, you find you can have electric charge flowing continuously through it, the battery. So it's very reproducible, uh, continuous, and it's, it's an incredible invention. And at that time, Napoleon ruled that part of the country and he actually visited the to get a demonstration. So Napoleon is a, is a gadget man. He really <laughs> loves new technology. Okay. So from the Walter's battery to today's iPhone, 200 years, what happened? How did we go from there to here? 
and I saw the incredible number of innovations and inventions, one built upon the other. It's all related. It's cumulative and coherent. <coughs> where we are. And it's too much to talk about it. Uh, if you read the book, it's all in there and how the connection goes. And you also see the interplay of technology, application, and science. Uh, sometimes applications <coughs> go way behind before the science, sometimes after. So it's a very complex situation. So what I would do is just highlight a few of those events. Uh, okay, let's go into those key events. The first industry that started after Volta's battery is electroplating. But that was a small arms and pops kind of operation, so I won't count on that. The real industry is telegraph. That's the first one. Turns out William Cook in Great Britain and Samuel Morse in the US both filed a pen in 1837. And, but Cook built the first working telegraph system uh, in England for a railroad company. And Morse, he tried to convince people to invest in him and build the uh, system, but there was really no taker. Uh, people still associate electricity with uh, Frank Franklin's uh, lightning and is afraid of electricity. So Morse is not able to convince anybody to do it for many years. And he's about to give up. When his patent was issued four years later, he said, well, I'm going to give you more try. And he got luck. He got $30,000 grant from the U.S. Congress was passed by like two votes. So all of a sudden he got $30,000, he recalled all his people on his team and demonstrated a uh, Baltimore to Washington link in 1844. And the picture over there, it, he set up the receiver, one of the stations in Washington in the Supreme Court. So he's a great uh, publicity uh, expert. And just happened in Washington, uh, in Baltimore that week, uh, Democrat Democrats have their convention, they're picking presidential candidates. So they're able to send information in a matter of seconds from Baltimore to Washington and back and forth. And it was a great publicity. From that point on, everybody wanted it. Okay, they see the value of it. So it's a tipping point. And the more systems grow very rapidly. And uh, through a licensing, fr franchising operation, many, many people license this technology and build telegraph systems. And very soon become the de facto standard. And the William Cook system in England never really took off. And the Cook made a mistake of uh, paying too much attention to elegance. The receiver for a Cook telegram had five wires. And a combination of the signal from five wires will automatically uh, point a needle to a, one of the 26 letters. So the receiver side, you don't need a decoding book. It's elegant. Uh, but at that time, the technology is very crude. So it would be expensive, unreliable, and people much prefer the simple Morse code, a single key. So Morse won in that contest. And in 1858, uh, American Cyrus Field invested in building the cross-Atlantic uh, telegram cable. Uh, all of a sudden, President Buchanan and Queen Victoria can send messages to each other. <laughs> it's incredible. And if people see the need later on to standardize. They set up ITU, International, now it's called International Telecommunication Union or whatever, it was the first international uh, technology. So this is how you look at uh, telegram in the, old, uh, the ordinary way. I mentioned I want to present that in a more kind of a business and technology uh, view. This is the model I like to use. In the middle is a creative, creative mastermind. He looked at the product, looked at what kind of technology is available, and able to assemble all these pieces into a certain application in a very creative way. And that's innovation. And you, you assemble that in a different way to optimize for a trade-off of features, performance, and cost for different uh, uh, users. And very often that using existing technology, you can only do so much. It's all trade-off. 
a lot of things you cannot do. And then once in a while you have a new invention coming up, the new enablers. If you can include those into the, uh, the mixture of things, all of a sudden you get a new super product. So this whole process is innovation and invention combined together. So I coined the word innovation. I'll give you some examples that everybody's familiar with. We have a Steve Jobs, great math, uh, mastermind, great innovator. When he developed Macintosh, he had Apple II already. He said, no, I'm going to build next generation. He has all the chips and the uh, uh, CRT and all that. All those pieces exist. They want to go beyond that. What he found is the graphic user interface and the mouse when he visited the Xerox Park. In fact, they're used in a system called Auto, Autos uh, Computer. And, and Steve Jobs said, this is what I want to use. So he tried to hire and raid those researchers to join Apple. But what happened is the cost to make a mouse at that time is $460. It was patented five years ago uh, it had SRI. They have no idea what to, use, to do with it. And the GUI would take up a lot of memory to implement, and which is way beyond what Macintosh cost, cost target would be. So Steve Jobs hired some new, uh, new graduates from college, challenged them to do what Xerox Park has done already, but reduce the cost. And he's able to reduce the mouse cost from $460 to $25, and then later on to $14. And he reduced the software memory needed to implement uh, GUI to about 20% of the provision. So there's a step of taking a research invention several years ago, sitting there idle, don't know what to do to take that stock step of uh, commercialize until the cost and performance is good enough to be used in the product. And then you have the Macintosh, it's a breakthrough. But it's really enabled by those new elements injected into it. Same thing with the uh, uh, iPod. And when all things is said, there's one missing piece in his iPod strategy. He wants to hold a thousand songs and the cost less than $200. At that time, if you use memory chips, it would be it would cost like eight hundred dollars. And then one of his engineers found that in Toshiba, in Japan, they have made a very small hard disk, one point eight inches. And Toshiba has no idea how to use it. And Apple said, "Okay, we can use that for our iPod." So that that's the uh, un un enabler for iPod. And then the iPhone came along. Initially, Steve Jobs worked with the Motorola trying to combine iPod with a Razer phone. But the combined thing just, it's not right. So he decided we had to do it from scratch. And he's looking for the differentiator. And what he decided on is the touch screen. Uh, you think that's the right interface for the new phone. And uh, he bought a, a small startup called uh, Fingerworks, the professor from Cornell, and he the other one, and that commercialize the technology and incorporate in iPhone. So this whole process of innovation combined with uh, invention enables the technology. So if you're using that model to look at Telegram, what happened is Moss certainly is the innovator in this case. He's driven by, he wants to be get rich. When he demonstrated Telegram, he's already 54 years old. He's pretty old. He's always been struggling on, on the edge of poverty. He was a portrait painter by, by training. And he already has the wires, battery switch, electromagnet, magnet, those things. What he added is two things. One is a simple messaging system, the Morse code. Just a digital, simple digital, one switch. And he actually stole that from one of his uh, uh, collaborators, Alfred. Oh. <laughs> the other technology used is a relay. And he stole that from Professor Joseph Henry. Uh, Relay is something that when the signal is getting weak, and the relay can regenerate it, so you can propagate again. So with the relay, you can propagate a message over a long distance. And he never acknowledged those people. Actually, all those people sued him later on. All his life, Moss was tied up in court. He also, so it's a good timing, because there was a killer app for Telegram. And that's a railroad dispatch, because America is building a huge railroad system. And how you dispatch a car or uh, trains, you need something faster than the train. And Telegram is perfect. 
In addition, railroad have the right uh, right of way along the track, so they can really put all those telegram posts along the way. So many reasons to make telegram successful. In fact, the way it's set up, it's hub and spoke kind of system, like the airline used to have. And actually, when you look at the architecture, it's very similar to internet today. But people call this uh, Victorian era internet. <laughs> so after 44, Telegram really uh, took off. Uh, and so many traffic on it, you want to put up new wires for it. But put a new wire, very expensive. So a lot of people begin to look for uh, a cheaper way of doing it. There were two people looking at ways of doing that. Gray and Bell. Alicia Gray from Western Union uh, and uh, Alexander Bell, a young dude. <laughs> and their concept is to uh, send different, you know, different telegram message on different pitch. Now you have one low frequency, da da da, the other can be dee dee dee. And if you send those things on the same wire, they will not inter uh, interfere with each other. And you can separate them on the other hand. So it's frequency multiplex. So they want to use frequency multiplexing to send, send multiple telegrams on a single wire. <coughs> and later on, they conceived that if you can send multiple pitch, that means you can send voice and music as well. Because voice and uh, music is just made up of different pitches of different amplitude. So they have that conceptual breakthrough. The next step is how do you invent a device which can convert your voice <coughs> or music into an ele electric current and to transmit them. And that took up all the effort. And uh, Bell was not able to come up with anything, but Gray was a super engineer. He conceived the idea of a vari variable resistor. He filed a patent, but patent was stolen by Bell, his, his father in the future. So Bell took his idea, but demonstrated ahead of Gray. And there's a lot of uh, hanky panky going on there. So what they end up with is a speaker which converts voice into electric current and another kind of, a, no, that's a microphone. And the other one is turning electric current into sound again. So that enables telephone. And so after it's demonstrated, they try to sell to the telegram company. And the telegram company said, telegram, they say, we, we have everything already. Your technology is like toys, it's useless. We don't need it. So out of desperation, the investor for Bell, that's his father-in-law, uh, decided to, to build a business himself. But he was not a businessman, and he hired this super guy, Theodore Vail. He's probably one of the greatest businessmen in American history. And today, any startup, this would be a dream CEO for a startup. <laughs> he built, based on very questionable, uh, low-quality technology into the whole Bell system company, AT&T, monopolize the whole, whole industry. It's Ted Bell. Bell. This guy is incredible. And Alexander Bell never played any role in building the business. He was very peripheral to all of that. But Ted Bell was very smart. He using Bell as an icon, spokesman for the company, kind of build him up. But Bell actually didn't do much at all. So after te tele uh, telephone become very popular. There's another technology happened before the end of the 19th century. That's wireless telegraphy. We all know Marconi. He is the innovator behind it. So this uh, business, this application, comes from basic science. In 1876, uh, Maxwell, Scottish, genius, he come up with these four simple equations. And that one solution describes the behavior of light, which is electromagnetic oscillation, travel with the speed of light. And turns out in his equation, such waves can exist at any wavelength. They can exist at wavelength shorter than light or longer than light. There's no reason why they, they don't exist. So people begin to search electromagnetic waves in, with frequency outside of the visible light. People don't know what, what those waves are. For 15 years, nobody was able to find them. And then a young German scientist by the name of Heinrich Hertz, he not only found the wave, but he's able to generate that and detect that. And he understands the theory perfectly. Everything fits the theory. 
And so Heinrich Hertz demonstrated how do you generate a, a current which radiates into space, become a wave. And then using a loop antenna, able to detect it. But Heinz was a uh, scientist. He just wanted to understand Maxwell's theory. Uh, and he died very young with a septic shock at the age of 37. So there was a lot of uh, news in the, uh, about Heinz's uh, work. And that caught the attention of a 19-year-old young man in Italy, Marconi. He came from a well, very well-to-do family, but he didn't like school very much. He liked to play things in his attic. And he got fascinated by uh, Hertz's experiment. And he duplicated it in his attic with his brothers. And he, he think, hey, I can use that to send messages, send and receive mes messages. And he, and he, how to send messages? Use Morse code. So he borrowed some, some technology which was new, now become uh, part of the building block technology. And he even used uh, Benjamin Frank's kite as the antenna on the receiver side, because the higher the uh, antenna is, the better you can receive it in a longer distance. So initially, he can, he can send messages like uh, one kilometer, and it becomes three kilometers. And he went to London to try to start a business. And his mother uh, was uh, very rich, from a very rich family of uh, Scottish uh, scotch, uh, the, the wine, the, the, the liquor. Maker. They invest, their family invested 100,000 pounds at that time into his venture. So very soon he got a grant from the government and built the Trans-English trans Channel link, 25 kilometers. And in 1901 to 02, the guy has got, he decided to show that you can actually transmit radio waves from England all the way to New York, 2,000 kilometers. And he did it. Okay. Remarkable guy. But he knew very little about physics. He's kind of an inventor. And he never attended college but he was one of the Nobel Prize winner, probably the only one who didn't have a real education. But and he's also a, a great businessman. He said that he feel, he know that this technology cannot compete with the, uh, the, the uh, wired uh, industry, telephone or telephone. <coughs> so he picked out markets which is unique, like communication between ship, ocean going ship. So in 1912, when Titanic sank, I think that's Marconi radio company operators on board. They sent out telegram, SOS, save us, I uh, had an iceberg. So they able to save over 700 people. So wireless uh, telegraphy is, is a quite remarkable technology. So at the end of the 19th century, uh, there are still some technical issues cannot be resolved. One is how to build a coast-to-coast -coast long distance telephone because telephone is an analog signal, it's not digital. The, the relay will not work. You need repeaters, very high precision repeaters to preserve the fidelity of the signal. The other is how do you transmit voice and music over wireless signals. Okay, Marconi's wireless system that cannot con convey voice or, or music. It's just DDD, DDD. And one Canadian engineer by the name of Fassenden come up with the idea of how to transmit voice and uh, music over wireless. But for that, he need a very high frequency, pure harmonic wave that carries the, the signal with it. And at that time, Fessenden works for Edison. So he told his idea to Edison and hope Edison would support him. Edison said, well, young man, you are daydreaming. That was impossible. Forget about it. Go back to work on your motors. So he left Edison and keep on working. And then, by the end of the uh, 19th century, there are already over 2 million users of a telephone. And the switch become very, very uh, cumbersome. You need something to switch it, hopefully electronically. And also, Edison has this phonograph. And the volume is quite low, actually. <coughs> uh, people would like to have a, can change, make it louder, lower, and, and you need an amplifier. So all those dreams require to have a high sensitivity amplifier and all a fast switch. And out of those needs, the biggest need is the long distance telephone. You have AT&T behind it, and Ted Vail want to, to build a monopoly, and universal service. And this long distance uh, line is a core part of its strategy. So all the independent companies has to, 
to join him, and he can absorb all the independence. So it's a, it's a key part of his business strategy. So he challenges people to come up with a solution. And so he set up a special team of technologists from the Western Union that built the Western Electric that builds telephone equipment. They go and find a solution to, to do this. And so that group of people began to fan out and look for a solution. And they didn't realize the solution was here already. And that's a vacuum trial, a vacuum tube. Okay. Vacuum tube, its original uh, principle come from Edison when he's developing a light bulb. When he put another electrode into the light bulb, he find that current can flow in one direction, but not the other. He asked his people, uh, engineers, say, anybody has an application for it? Nobody has an application? So he filed a patent and just move on. Didn't do anything about it. But one of his engineers at that time is called John Fleming. He's a British... Uh, physicist. He's aware of this phenomenon. And 20 years ago, Fleming, 20 years later, Fleming was a consultant to Marconi to do the wireless system. At that time, people know that if you can rectify the radio wave, you can have a much higher sensitivity to, to detect the signal. So Fleming all of a sudden said, well, I can use the Edison effect for that. So Fleming developed something called a uh, Fleming valve, which is a vacuum dial, just to it's a rectifying vacuum tube. And then come this engineer, Lee D. Forrest. Very mediocre uh, engineer, not very, very well respected at all. It's kind of a strange guy. Uh, he was at one time uh, kind of uh, accused of fraud. Uh, Command no respect, but he's a thinker. He would play around with things. So he took a vacuum dial, and for no reason, added another electrode in between those two electrodes. He called that a grid. There are so many people, you know, outstanding scientists or engineers working on vacuum dial, but nobody has ever thought about inserting a third electrode into it. It's truly out of box. And to his surprise, that now you have an electrode in the middle, and you can, you can have a current flowing across it, across this, uh, these two plates. And when, he, when he applied a negative voltage on it, all of a sudden the current will stop. Remove the voltage, current will start again. So it's a switch, right? But even better, if you put a small signal onto this grid, it will change the, the major, the, the main current flow according. So it's an amplifier. Put a small signal on the grid, you have an amplifier signal from the rest of the current flow. So in one stroke, he, div uh, he discovered the principle of electronic amplifier and a switch. But he had no idea how to use it. He didn't know what to use this for. He did not even understand the physics of it. So he called it audion. The, the last word is I-O-N. He thought it's an ionic conduction process, not electronic. It's totally wrong. So he tried to play around with it, tried to convince people to buy it. Nobody bought, uh, buys it. So it's sitting in his attic, you know, gathering dust for five years. But the uh, Bell system, AT&T people, aware of this device, and after they evaluate, then this is the solution to the long distance phone call. Uh, phone. So, so AT&T paid $50,000 to acquire the uh, IP for the vacuum dial, and then turned 200 people working on it to work out the physics, manufacturing technology, reduce cost, improve reliability. So, and, and AT&T began to mass produce the vacuum dial uh, trial. And they also developed very high performance repeaters. They can amplify the weak analog signal voice and, and uh, transmit over longer distance, just like a relay. So in 1914, the New York City to San Francisco long distance phone line. Broke. And that's because of the, the uh, vacuum trial. Uh, and Ted Bell was so happy, and he expanded the, the, uh, the team, the technology team, and that became Bell Labs later on. And once you have this electronic amplifying switch in place, it's kind of a foundational technology. All of a sudden, the sky is just coming down. All kind of inventions. Uh, Edwin Armstrong using the, 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 the amplifier of a vacuum trial and add a feedback feature to it and you get a current which oscillates at very high frequencies. <coughs> and that's exactly what's needed to make radio wave to carry voice and music. 
So he invented the radio. And then faster, faster than uh, used a lot of vacuum tubes to make a television. And the Watson Watt in England in the late starting from 35, 1935, begin to develop a chain home coastal radar system using vacuum tubes. That turns out, out to be uh, instrumental in defeating the German uh, air force in the Battle of uh, Great Britain. <coughs> radar started by vacuum tubes. And then the first digital computer was built in the 1940s with vacuum trial. So this invention of the vacuum trial is a really a watershed event. Let's say that all those inventions have great stories behind them. And I just want to highlight the computer. The computer, the two main guys for ENIAC is uh, John Maltry and uh, Acker, his graduate student. Uh, Maltry was a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. And they uh, wrote a proposal to U.S. Army, Aberdeen Test uh, Proven Graph, to build a computer to calculate the uh, trajectile prediction for uh, new guns and uh, bullets and uh, shells. And the total funding is only half a million dollars, which is very small. So, so the, to develop a computer was not like the Manhattan Project or the radar effort that government spent billions. This is only a half a million dollar investment. Uh, actually, Maltry and Acker, Maltry, he stole the idea from a professor, young professor from Iowa State University by the name of uh, Atanasov. Atanasov invited him to his uh, home, show him his ideas, and then actually use all his ideas without technology. <laughs> and John von Neumann, the great scientist from uh, Princeton, he later on looked at the computer, the architecture, and made a lot of critical suggestions. Uh, and he was he and Maltry just don't see eye to eye at all. So anyway, the ENIA computer was on the University of Pennsylvania com uh, campus. It uses 17,468 vacuum tubes. It's become brute force. That's brute force. <laughs> uh, consumes 160 kilowatt, hour, uh, kilowatt, which is more than the power of the first power generation station built by Edison to, to light the lower Manhattan. Uh, weighs over 60,000 pounds. It can do 5,000 additions of subtractions per, uh, per second which is almost two orders of magnitude better than electromechanical computer at the time. So everybody, it's very clear to everybody, digital computer has a great future. Uh, but the main time to failure is 36 seconds. <laughs> 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 it just fails all the time. It rarely worked. It's a good thing, it finished in 1946. The war was over. <laughs> Nobody was counting on it to do any useful work. Uh, but the architecture, the way it's work, is really the precursor to other, other computers. Actually, in 1946, the dean of the uh, University of Pennsylvania School of Engineering called a meeting. He invited 36 of the top computer scientists to have a summer school. He shared all the information about ENIAC. And all those 36 people later on become key people in, the, uh, in building the computer industry. I say this is the first computer. Uh, I have to qualify that, because when I look at this computer, that, that's a lot of similarity. This is a computer called a Colossus. It's built five years earlier uh, by the British, but it's a top, top secret project. Nobody can talk about it. It broke the German codes. Uh, and Tom Flowers was the leader. And he was frustrated seeing all the glory those people are getting. He said, we have done that a long time ago, but I can't talk about it. But I think this is time to, <laughs> to uh, <laughs> to recognize contributions, yes. Can you talk about the IBM punch cards which preceded that? Which is not a computer, it's kind of a data. I can talk to you later, okay. Anyway, okay, now it's all clear. The, the problem with uh, computer is vacuum tubes. Vacuum tubes make it work, but also because of unreliability and power hungry, you cannot scale. People know that, the architecture for the computer is so scalable, ENIAC. People can say, well, if we have a million uh, tubes, the computer's power will be incredible. Right? But it's impossible to put a million tubes. Right? 17,000 is already beyond the limit. So in order to 
to jump beyond that point, you need a better replacement for that compute. So that's the holy grail. And one person is really has better feeling about this than anybody else. His name is uh, Mervyn Kelly. He was the leader of the vacuum tube development group at Bell Labs. At that time, he became the research director of Bell Labs. That's the leader of Bell Labs research uh, group. He knew that's the end of vacuum tubes. You cannot do anything more beyond what has been done. And in order to go beyond, you need a new approach. And he has great resources under him, Bell Labs. And his vision, actually, is the VB forest put a third electrode into this vacuum rectifier, build the vacuum trial. I thought there was another phenomenon at that time. And the first demonstrated by uh, Ferdinand Braun in 1874, German, is to put a cat whisker a wire on top of a piece of a semiconducting material, that's sulfide in this case. And many of you probably know crystal radio, maybe too young for that. Rectify. Same principle. So both are rectifying devices. Is there any way we can put a third electrode in this configuration? And that will be a tiny solid state child. He, he has that vague idea, but he knew it would be very difficult, and he didn't know how to do it. And his action is to build the best team he can, and provide them the best support. He knew the question has to be answered by basic science in physics, solid state physics. So he went out and recruited uh, many outstanding people. And 10 years later, the investment paid off. That's the invention of the transistor. So the people working on transistors, not it's all defined by Mervyn Kelly. Please come up with a solution. It's not that somebody accidentally discovered a transistor. It's not. There's a top-down drive for it. Uh, it took 10 years, even though there was a break in between the war. And a lot of brilliant individuals. This guy, Shockley, William Shockley, is truly brilliant. And Rector is a very insightful, good with hands-on, no nonsense, very clever. Bardeen, the only one who have two Nobel Prize in physics. Super smart guy. Those people are theoreticians, experimenters, work together. And they share offices together. And, and Shockley is kind of a brain behind a lot of these things. He acknowledged, he learned a lot from a water shock, a German scientist, who worked out the physics of a point contact rectifier. And that inspired the rest of them for the rest of the to take. And also, it's not just a physicist point of view. It's a multidisciplinary team. And key people, a lot of people make key contribution. Gordon Thiel is a material scientist. He was the one who grow silicon and germanium crystals, which are perfect. Now, these atoms line up in perfect order, no defect, so that people can make good transistors out of them. And Fan, he was a mailroom clerk, a high school graduate at Bell Labs. He is intrinsically extremely smart. He came up with the idea and demonstrated that you can reduce the impurity atoms in germanium to 10 parts per trillion. It's called something called a uh, floating zone refining technique. So the material is so perfect, so pure, that allows the theory to work, to make transistors. So it's, it's a incre incredible. And the solid state physics, so what those people have can visualize things at a subatomic level. <clears throat> Look at the crystal structure, you can predict how the electron will flow. Uh, it's, it's not something by coincidence it would come up with. It's based on science. Okay, now you have the transistor, which has been always compared as a wheel in transportation, as a transistor in electronics, and it truly is. In 1954, uh, AT&T said, what should we do with transistor technology? And the decision was to license it to anybody in, in NATO countries uh, for $25,000. Anybody can go there and they will teach you how to make a transistor, how to build the equipment. as a big brochure, in a big book, teach you all the details. Give you two weeks of training of your people you send. Them. All that for $25,000. And a lot of, you know, 44 companies came to sign up, including a big uh, electrical company, like IBM, GE, Westinghouse, Philco, Raytheon, RC, Sylvania, all those companies. But there are also some small companies, not very well known, 
like a Texas instrument. At that time, it's a $2 million company, only make instruments for oil exploration. But they have a visionary CEO coming. He said, computer, transistor, semiconductor is the future. He licensed it and turned it into Texas instrument. By the way, he hired the Gordon Teal from Bell Labs, the one who prepared the material, and turns out to be a great uh, recruit. Motorola was a car radio company. They licensed TTK, Tokyo Telecom, a telecommunication company. It's a small Japanese company that make small uh, recorders, electronic recorders. They came and licensed it. And so the, the transistor industry began to take off. And there are a lot of reasons. No, so this is the vacuum tube, and this is a package transistor. You can see the size difference and power difference. And the military used the transistor very early on to improve the computer. The radio. And IBM, at that time, they were building the 360, which is the new generation of computers. And they, they used a transistor for that. And also, enable the new classes of products. <coughs> it's so small, so uh, you don't need that much power, low voltage. So you can now make portable radios. You can put on your pocket, in your pocket. And this was started by Texas Instrument. They, they make the first radio. Uh, but later on, copied by the Japanese company, TTK. And using the lower cost and exchange rate difference, TTK really conquered the world with that, with their uh, radio transistor, portable radio. And that company later changed their name, Sony. So you can see the, the transistor started a huge industry. Okay, and now kind of a little bit of a small diversion. The birth of Silicon Valley. None of the company I listed earlier located in Silicon Valley. So why Silicon Valley become the center of semiconductor? Turns so out, it go back to this guy Shockley, the inventor, one of the three uh, inventor with the Nobel Prize. Shockley. He getting restless at Bell Labs. See all the industries coming up. People are getting rich, and he's no longer interested in publishing papers and recognized as an academic authority. He won his name in the Wall Street Journal every day. He wants to get rich, <laughs> and he convinced his buddy when he was at Caltech, a guy called Arnold. Uh, instrument, Beckman, uh, Beckman <coughs> instrument, to invest one million dollar with him to start his uh, transistor company uh, factory, and Beckman want him to locate the company in Orange County near Los Angeles. But Shockley said, "No, no, I want to go home." I saw his home is Palo Alto. His aging mother still lived. So Shockley took the money and started. Uh, Shockley Transistor Lab in Mountain View today, at the corner of El Camino and uh, San Antonio. The, the building was still there. And he began to recruit people to join him. But none of the colleagues from Bell Lab joined him because they all knew this guy is difficult to get along. Nobody <laughs> wants to, just want to stay away from him. Out of desperation, he began to recruit young people all over the country, from schools, from other companies. And, and Shockley is very good in sport uh, talent. So he recruited a lot of young people from the East Coast mostly to join him. Uh, this picture is when in 1956, Shockley got a Nobel Prize and all his young people are celebrating for him. But things didn't, uh, the good thing didn't last very long because Shockley was such a strange guy, paranoid and bad businessman, bad manager, as bad as can be. So you can be a Nobel Prize winner, but terrible in other areas. So finally, the eight people, eight of them, called the traitorous eight, they decide to leave. And they find a VC, uh, Arthur Rock, the investor from Wall Street, find them another investor, Sherman Fairchild, to put one and a half million dollars for those eight people to spin off. So took all the technology from Shockley Transistor and start a company called the Fairchild Semiconductor. And those eight people, each putting $500 and would share 5% of the company. Three years later, when they sold their share, each of them made $250,000. So, so the whole VC startup model started from that. Uh, and then the Fairchild Semiconductor uh, was very successful in, in terms of developing new technology. But the DNA is such that what they have done to Shockley <laughs> was done to them by their employees. <laughs> So one by one, their employees leave and start their own companies using the company's <coughs> technology. In the end, all eight of them left also. And the last two, 
uh, not the last two, uh, two of them were the uh, number one and number two guy, Bob Noyce and uh, Gordon Moore, they started in Intel. So the Asia spin-off, at one time there were 400 companies in the Bay Area on their origin, directly or indirectly, to Fairchild. <coughs> Except for one early case, none of them ever got sued. So they encouraged people to, to go and start their company. Uh, there's a lot of interesting story why they were not sued. Uh, there's no time to talk about that. But it's not a top-down strategy by government. There's no policy. And somehow it happened, and in a very effective way. Okay, why all those uh, stories of uh, companies going on, technology never stopped, actually accelerated. At TI, a guy called uh, uh, Jack Kilby recognized that he can put multiple transistors and dial together, wire them up, and can build a whole circuit on the chip, integrated circuit. And uh, Bob Noyce at Fairchild has a better approach using so-called planar parts. You can not only have connect them together, but in a complete way also can connect them on the chip. So this is the first uh, true integrated circuit chip. It's a four transistor flip-flop, which is a building block for a computer and larger. Uh, in the beginning, integrated circuit was not very well uh, respected because they feel it's costly and not very reliable. But the US government, uh, every time you are building the Miniman missile and Poseidon and Apollo, you need reliable electronics. So the government pumped a lot of money to help those companies to solve their yield and reliability problems until it reaches a stage, the computer company. And along the way, people also recognize that one way to improve the chip is to shrink the size. Because that's a great trade-off. When you shrink the size, the performance gets better, and the unit cost drops. There's no better trade-off. So in the next 50 years in the chip industry, it just keeps on shrinking the size. So that's so-called Moore's law. For 50 years, the number of transits on a chip doubles almost in every 18 to 24 months. And also the technology of semiconductor and microfabrication drives other technology like LCD and hard disks. So you know, it was based on your own experience, that if there's an electronic product come out, you wait for six months, and you get something better, more powerful and cheaper. And that's what most law is at work. And just some example, like uh, any computer built in 1946, 25 years later, the four old chip, the computer chip, first CP, uh, microprocessor, has about the same computing power as the ENIAC. And the measure size is 0.3 times 0.4 centimeters. It's incredible. You know, 25 years ago, nobody would ever dream you can reproduce a whole room full of hardware with a tiny chip. Another thing from the chip, uh, from the noise flip flop in 614 transistor, so last year, the Xenon chip has five and a half billion transistors on the chip, about the same size. Now, it's, it's a lot more than the Wright Brothers airplane compared with the A380. The, the scale difference is even bigger. And it can have more and more functions integrated into the chip. For example, the one on the right is the newest the Qualcomm chip that powers all the Android phone calls, uh, cell phones. Almost all the core, the guts of the phone is in one chip. So, that kind of brings us to the uh, to where we are today. So, one point I try to say is where will all the new technology come from? Uh, I think the incremental technology, the industry is doing a great job. And every generation of iPhone is getting better. It's all incremental improvement. And in, in terms of innovators, the, there's such a competitive landscape. So many innovators there try to think about new way to do things. VCs come in, try to do that. So that don't have to worry about. The major worry is the source of uh, the major inventions. Where would that come from? Here is something that's a different talk. You know, what's the inventor? Where, where do they come from? But I'm going to skip this. Just, just say a few words about uh, lessons learned in all this. Two organizations for semiconductors to think about. Bell Labs and Fairchild. Bell Labs have accomplished so much you know, from transistor, solar cell, lasers, information theory, AI, DSP, Cell phone cells like all come from Bell Labs. And the reason? Prestige, they can attract the best. Critical mass, multidiscipline, stable funding, they are not up to the uh, market fluctuation of the company's performance. But the key is domain focus. All the research work at Bell Lab, people know it has to do with communications. And 
For example, if you do image processing in at Bell Lab, because they're thinking about picture form, how do you can have a picture form? It's a holy grail. The other is dynamic turnover. People at Bell Lab are extremely highly competitive environment. People are told at the end of each year what percentile you are in. If you are the under you know, 25 percentile in the bottom, you better think about leaving. So it's not a comfortable place. It's constantly new people coming in, new people going out. A lot of people will go to the universities, and that's a good way of dispersing technology. <laughs> so it's not the same people there constantly. It's a, it's a turnover. And Fairchild is entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurship, great technical people, and very loose management. Fairchild is managed by headquarters in Long Island. They have no idea what these guys are doing. And they do great work. It didn't help the company's uh, book very much, but helped the US industry tremendously. How do you stimulate this kind of environment when it comes to doing discovery research in health, biotech, energy, environment? You probably don't need, need this kind of organization for software or encryption. That can be done by a few clever people. But for those big items, you do still need a organization like this. I don't think our national lab is, uh, is doing its job. So concluding, 200 years of incredible amount of uh, invention, and they build upon each other, rather than so scattered. It's coherent. Uh, the interplay of science, technology, and application is convolved, very complex. It's not a linear from research to development to product to whatever. And that's a harmful way of thinking. And then Moore's law finally is, is coming to an end. And if you want to have questions, what's going to happen? There's a new article from uh, Economist, just came out March 12th. It's a very detailed analysis of what, uh, what's the implication. It is coming to an end. In fact, we are witnessing the end of uh, Moore's law because the cost increase, performance increase has peaked, it's become diminishing return. Uh, but there's still plenty of things going on. One thing nobody talked about, I think in the future, making chips will be much, much cheaper. Because the Intels and TSMCs, they don't need to invest as much in the research or buy a new set of equipment. Uh, today, to, to build a new state-of-the-art IC uh, factory will cost $7 billion. Mm -hmm. If you don't have to do that, all of a sudden, each chip costs it. So whoever anticipates that well, I think it will do very well. The chip-making company become book printing operations. The value is in with the authors writing books, the designers, uh, and the imagination has no limit. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, I see we're running a little short on time, so I'll cut short my my uh, my questions and comments. Uh, first of all, fantastic presentation, fantastic book. Uh, got a question about. Um, the whole thing with the copper wire going up to a kite and hoping the kite gets hit with the lightning. How does that end for the guy holding the kite? <laughs> uh, uh, lucky. There's no real historical record that he there actually did. It's <laughs> a, it's a, but one guy tried to duplicate that in uh, Denmark. The guy got electrocuted. It was killed. Right. Okay, there we go. So I told my son not to try that one. Um, but I did tell my son to read this book. This is a this is a, a fantastic read. Uh, it's very comprehensible to the layman. Um, well, one of the great things about your book is you put is you put so many personalities and the personal stories in into the history of innovation. Um, this guy who invented the digital computer, Alan Soft, who really did the fundamental work. You probably don't know the guy never took a patent out on that. And so uh, it was decided by the courts that digital computers were part of the public domain. Um, Thomas Edison, he brought new, uh, new meaning to uh, marketing a product. Uh, the whole electric grid was a big battle between AC and DC, alternating current and direct current. Alternating current by far the superior product. Um, Thomas Edison was the invention of the DC current approach. And um, he went around electrocuting uh, dogs and elephants to show that the D D uh, DC current was somehow safer. He was electrocuting with alternating current. So um, an another kind of interesting personal tale there was uh, Alexander Graham Bell. He did a lot of these kind of seamy things because of the influence of his future father-in-law, who was a very powerful and rich entrepreneur, 
but uh, he wasn't going to let Alexander Graham Bell marry his daughter unless Alexander Graham Bell was complicit with all this kind of sleazy stuff that made him famous. Um, so there's a love story behind that one, a twisted one. Um, and then uh, Silicon Valley, we also heard that uh, Silicon Valley uh, would uh, still be um, orange groves and walnut groves if it were not for the fact that uh, Shockley's mother uh, was from Palo Alto. Uh, so a lot of interesting twists uh, in the story of innovation based on very, very personal um, realities. Um, I think the most important thing is that I was finishing up the book uh, Flying Home last night uh, with my son, and, and that is that I think all young people should have some kind of basic understanding of where this little guy came from. Um, um, I, think it's, I think it's essential. This, these products are so foundational in our lives, but we have no idea where they're from. Um, so, Derek, you do a fantastic job talking about the, the uh, invention of the telegram, the telegraph, uh, the telephone, the, the, the radio, but you do a remarkable job on what's near and dear to me in my job, which is uh, uh, semiconductors. That, um, you know, to be sure, uh, uh, Shockley and the two other guys that invention, invented the transistor were critical to the whole thing, but I thought you really... Um, teased out the importance of Bell Labs. You know, Bell Labs, AT&T Bell, was this kind of a special place because AT&T was a regulated monopoly. And every year, AT&T with the federal government said, we're going to spend this much on research. The federal government said, yeah, that sounds about right. And all that big amount of money went over to Bell Labs. And so Bell Labs had this incredibly patient capital there that allowed uh, this uh, innovation to flourish, this very competitive environment to flourish, which which Derek laid out nicely. Um, and, and, and what was invented at Bell Labs? It was the transistor, which was the beginning of the of the of, of the semiconductor industry. And then remarkably, as you pointed out, Derek, <coughs> Bell Labs said, hey, we'll sell that technology to anybody who wants it. $25,000. I don't know what that is in today's dollars. It was a fair amount back then, but still a real steal, I guess, huh? Um, so the other piece here um, that um, you didn't get into much, at least for the semiconductor industry, and it's again kind of one of these fickle uh, historical um, realities, is that things happen when, it, when industries are being developed that put things on hold and out escalate. Uh, the, the speed of innovation. One of them was uh, the Cold War. Well, one of them was the Second World War. Semiconductor innovation dropped off dramatically. Transistor innovation dropped off dramatically. Cold War comes along. Tons of defense money goes into the semiconductor industry, which had a lot to do with helping to bring the industry to where it is today for defense applications. Um, the other, the, other, the other great thing I think you do is you really tell a great story about how semiconductor industry, the business side of it, flourished in the valley. And it was this um, incredible fruit not falling very far from the tree. And that is, tree grows up, the fruit, the fruit ripens, falls from the tree, rolls out, and grows other trees. And thousands of semiconductor industries semiconductor companies grew out of that one company that was formed by William Shockley, one of the three founders, uh, inventors of the, of the transistor. Anyway, it's a fascinating tale, probably not a tale that's ever been repeated in any other industry in the history of, of, of mankind. Um, there's just a couple of things, two cautionary takeaways from your book and your presentation, Derek. One, um, to be successful to take on these grand societal challenges, seems it's absolutely necessary to have a place for pre-competitive research to be going on. And that is going on in a lot of different quarters, uh, and it's being funded by the USG. But I'll tell you that uh, USG funding, and this is something that Semiconductor Industry Association is pressing the USG to do, to remedy, USG funding for basic research is beginning to taper off. Um, right now, it accounts for about, um, in the semiconductor space, it accounts for about half of all government 
funded research. Um, and let's just take another player out there who wants to be up and coming. China represents about a quarter of the funding for semiconductor research, government funding. Uh, in 2020, is projected to flip. 2020, U.S. G funding for semiconductor research will be about a quarter of all funding around the world, and Chinese funding will be about a half of all funding. So one thing that we continue to press the U.S. government for is to pay more attention to putting funds into this kind of pre-competitive research, which was, which Derek, you do such a great job of laying out. Most of your book is about all that pre-competitive research. And then the second thing is, is talent. Um, it's very apparent in your presentation, in your book, is that you got to have those smart scientists, the smart uh, in innovators who can do the inc incremental technology, uh, in uh, incremental innovations, but also you need the cowboys uh, as part of the mix. And, you know, uh, we do a great job in this country of educating smart people in our universities. Many of them are from overseas. But we don't do a great job because of our, our immigration law of keeping them here. More and more of these innovators uh, that were trained, spending a lot of money to train here in our universities, are going back home because they can't stay here because of our visa policies. So this is something that you know we think is very important for us to focus on: is making sure we have the incremental innovators and the cowboys. Um, that's all I want to add. But fantastic book, and I really it's. It's really a great. Uh, it's really a great read, and I'm a scientific layman, and I actually got through it. Thanks, Derek. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Derek, one quick question. Um, I know you responded to John said, and all of the audience. Um, you, you talk about the role, of course, of visionary entrepreneurs and innovators. But one thing that comes through clearly in the book is the companies that are not visionary. Uh, you write on page 215 about how the transistor was originally viewed by companies who were competing with the vacuum tube technology as, quote, an unwelcome competitor. Um, uh, you talk about how Sylvania and RCA couldn't make leaps to leverage new technologies like LCDs. Um, uh, how, how do we deal with these corporate mindsets that are of risk and innovation verse? There's a self-selection process going on. Those who cannot adjust, just buy. Uh, for example, in Sylvania, they were one of the biggest vacuum tube companies. They licensed the transistor and put the transistor group under the vacuum provision. No future in it because the, the mindset is just not in that. But all the big companies who license transistor technology, none of them did very well. It's the small, hungry, New companies like TI, Motorola, Sony, these are the companies really made it. So there's a self-selection process going on. You, you cannot ask those uh, big establishments <coughs> to change, but they will be taken over by new guys. I'm sure we must have many questions from the audience, so I'll take them as I see them. Uh, uh, my name is Jack Chilton. Um my question is related to Moore's law. Uh, I know that, uh, you know, because of miniaturization, uh, I've defined computers 2 gigahertz and 3 gigahertz, and we haven't reached 4 yet. I know they have uh, additional calls and so on. But uh, don't you feel that uh, in the area of storage of electricity, we've got some way to go? Um, I know that with the handheld phone, you've got enough battery power to do lots of things but when it comes to motive force and heating and so on all this free electricity coming down from the sun uh, can you store it storage everybody's looking for the holy grail for battery technology but when you look at the principles of batteries and look at a periodic table lithium type of spice you can go and turns out there's a lot of things to be done in the lithium technology <coughs> And one thing that Elon Musk said that really hit me very hard is uh, a lithium battery, all the energy is stored in the uh, lithium element. But only about 2% of the weight is lithium. The other 98% are passive in a way to make it safe and other things. Uh, there's a lot of ways to improve that. And yeah, not looking for all the magnitude improvements. Sometimes a factor of two, huge. And I think with those 
uh, improving packaging, improving the economy of scale. Uh, the current lithium battery, uh, without even any new uh, elements in it, can probably be reduced by a factor of three. And then all of a sudden, enable a lot of other things. <coughs> Bill Warren with Applied Materials. Uh, sort of related to the, to the first question, you know, since the telegraph, it seems that the communications field has, has been the focus of all this uh, innovation. Uh, just, you know, as you've looked through this over the years, what do you see as next? I mean, we've almost run to the end of the communications of uh, being able to drive this. I mean, you know, unless somebody can figure out how to use this for telepathy, there's really not a whole lot left. Uh, so what, what uh, any thoughts on where you yeah, see this going? Yeah, thinking, thinking a lot about that. First of all, Applied Materials did a great job on developing equipment. Yeah, and I hope you're recently. wrong about that prediction about equipment, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> Uh, what's beyond? Uh, what law has reached a limit? And the communication, of, like a display, the resolution is so high, you, you improve another factor of 16, so what? I cannot be uh, So the electronics has reached a point where I think it's, uh, I can't be wrong. Uh, it's, uh, beyond that, probably the major breakthroughs will be not as often. But there are areas like uh, health, uh, energy, environment, uh, electronics will play a very big role in enabling them. For example, like all the wearables to monitor your health, today's sensor technology is so primitive. Now, we talk about monitor in an unintrusive way of blood sugar, right? It's not a single technology which is reliable today. And research like that can change. The other thing is uh, the chips now, some research is to read your brainwave. Uh, that will enable a lot of things. So, so it's the application of what we have, electronic technology, that will branch out, permeate all the big challenges ahead of us. Okay, hi, Francis Wallace from the Roosevelt Institute, though I'm here on a personal capacity. Um, so it's one thing to talk about uh, consumer electronics or consumer products uh, you know, on a micro scale, uh, but I like to look at uh, more like macro infrastructure uh, services, products, what have you, uh, because the U.S. really is facing the reality of aging infrastructure. We've not had like a large wave of construction in decades, and we're seeing both our water infrastructure and our uh, even our electrical grid just not really meet, uh, be ready to meet the challenges of the, the 21st century economy. Speaking specifically to the power grid, uh, the U.S. doesn't really have a federal uh, or even state level kind of strategy for how do we, for upgrading the grid. I'm wondering where do we need to see the leadership to emerge for us to transition towards a smarter, cleaner grid? And I emphasize a smarter grid because I often say that uh, you can, ha if, if you'd like a cleaner energy system, you need to have a smarter grid to account for all the variability that that uh, cleaner energy sources have, as well as storage. So, so again, where does that leadership need to come from? That, that's beyond beyond technology. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it involves so many other things. It's very yes. much a policy thing. Maybe Stephen can answer that. No, I, I guess that's too complicated for me. Or even like it industry, like, like how can we have an industry coordination. coordination? Sorry, it seems there's certainly an important uh, federal role for coordination. And also then working with the states and the cities to bring smart cities into this digital era because all these platforms will have to be. Come on April 20th when we uh, have an event focused on uh, how cities can future proof themselves. Uh, I'll fed that in, thanks. Okay. okay. I think the uh, electronic sensors and the distributed communication system, you know, that so called Internet of Things, uh, can probably improve a lot of infrastructure in a very, very cost effective way. So, and, and one of the big things that you pointed out was managing a grid uh, that um, is potentially cleaner. Um, for example, the, the Nest uh, devices and uh, thermostats. It's critically important that the load is, is managed correctly by these, by these companies that real power. If it loads too much, the system breaks down, and uh, semiconductors are a huge part of that to, to make sure these are smart grids that, that can adapt to uh, cleaner technologies going in and off of them. I'm Jessica Lynn. I'm with the Department of Energy. So 
actually, uh, some of that was addressed in our last uh, quadrennial energy. I'm sorry, quadrennial energy report, yeah. uh, which is available on the web. But my question actually is: um, you mentioned that the national labs are not playing the role they should. What would you suggest in terms of improvements to innovations coming out of the labs? Um, you know, for example, there's the MDF, which sits outside of Oak Ridge, so that it can be available to um, companies and to commercialization. Uh, so there, and there's a Brookings report that talked about the challenges to the National Lab and made some suggestions. But you know, when you look at the Spell Lab um, and just the fruitfulness of those um, those ideas, like how do you think we can improve the National Lab system? That's a loaded question. I think National Lab all have their own role. I think you need to define the role very narrowly and keep a small staff on that rather than bloated organization. Uh, the key thing in research is uh, turnover. Keep it dynamic. New people come in with new ideas. Uh, people's half-life of their technical expertise is much longer than the turn of the, the market need. So many times you have people that are doing research which the problem is no longer exist. So how do you handle people become a job issue? Uh, it's, it's not easy. But the way what we have right now is not optimal. And uh, burn too much valuable resource. You talk about national lab commercialization. How many successful cases have there been? Very, very few. Most of technology come out are not quite right. That's why it's done in national lab, because the commercial industry is not doing it. It's not quite right. It's gold-plated. It's not needed and when it comes to cost. And other things coming in, somehow it's just not a match. By the way, if you haven't seen ITIF's report co-authored with the Center for American Progress and the Heritage Foundation called uh, Turning the Page, Bringing the National Labs in the 21st Century, it's a very bipartisan set of recommendations about how uh, the national labs can uh, implement policy reforms to uh, encourage the national Sure, yeah. Yes, hi. My name is Todd Wiggins of MeetMeDC.com. I enjoyed a great deal of what you had to say about what the measures are of the people who are innovative thinkers and how you determine who's capable, regardless of whether they have an education, a high school or college education, that, that uh, desire to do these things. But I wanted to ask you, one part that I was missing was about nan nanotechnology, which obviously helped make the transition possible. Is that being developed simultaneously in uh, Japan, at the same time that U.S. I, I know about TDY, which, as you said, became a Sony. But um, was was that was there sort of a competition between Japan Japan uh, scientists at the same time that things were developing in uh, California, Silicon Valley? Uh, nanotechnology includes many many different things. It's kind of a catchword, especially professors like to use that. It's hard to say you know, what nanotechnology is really doing. Uh, I think the main advantage is at the nanoscale, sometimes there are some unique properties which are order of magnitude from, different from the bulk property. And how do you take advantage of those unique properties? Uh, it's a big field. The whole scientists, scientific community all over the world are working on that. That's room for everybody. Uh, but so far, the success cases are still not that many. A lot of money has been spent. Doesn't mean that it won't work. Uh, but just like any basic research, you don't know something will be useful you know, five years from now, 10 years from now. Uh, we just build up whole, a kind of reservoir of things. Somewhere down the road, all of a sudden something may click. That's the difficulty of measuring basic research. Mm -hmm. you, you don't know when will this pay off. It may be great work. But at that time, a year later, you cannot measure it. So a lot, lot of faith, that's an art of measuring, uh, of supporting research. So, probably did not answer your question very well, but nano is a big area, and there's room for everybody. I just want to know why in the early 80s, it seemed as if Japan was on the leading edge, and, and you didn't even hear about technology, technological innovation coming out of China so much as you do now. So what was happening then? Uh, Japan at that time, uh, booming. And the government helped METI. They uh, started a lot of uh, national labs. But their national labs are different from US. There's a lesson to be learned there. Each national lab in Japan have a theme, like a telecom, like fiber optics, like display. And they, had, they set up a seven-year sunset clause in 
at the end of seven years, the lab will be closed, will be dispersed. If it's good, they will find another lab and start over again. But there's no entitlement after seven years. And that tends to work pretty well. But today, Japan is different. And Korea is really eating their lunch in a lot of electronic products. Mm -hmm. And one reason, I was talking with my friend from the Sony Labs. He said the Sony Galaxy project, the, the cell phone, have 36 projects. And the average age for the project manager, project leader, was 36. <laughs> Whereas in Japan, Sony, or other people, the average age of them, all those project managers are probably in the late 50s. And in today's technology, that already you lose. Now you need young people with a new way of doing things. You cannot have the late 50 running, running new products. <laughs> in Japan, their seniority system is so strong that really uh, curtail the, uh, the innovation process. Hi, I'm uh, Gene O'Brien. I'm just recently retired from AARP. <coughs> and um, I just really enjoyed your presentation. It was just uh, really enlightening. Are you excited about the future of quantum computing? In, in that article I point out to you, in, uh, uh -huh. the economist has a very nice uh, analysis of the strengths and weaknesses. As more slow come to an end, it will not be replaced by one technology. I don't think there's a replacement for silicon. But for different unique applications, there may be different approaches. In some of the encryption kind of thing, quantum computing may play a role. Uh, memory, there may be another material approach can, can solve it, but not in the overall thing. Each of them will kind of uh, create a, a niche. Thank you. So Derek, kind of on the theme of the last question, uh, you Jimmy. talked a lot about, uh, sorry, Jimmy Goodrich with the Semiconductor Industry Association. Um, you talked a lot about the history of the industry and how it was created with ingenuity, a lot of entrepreneurship, obviously some government support with uh, labs and pre-competitive R&D. Now we fast forward to today, see China investing upwards of 160 billion into their own domestic semiconductor industry. But just on Monday, it was announced that they'll establish a $25 billion national memory company. So uh, with your experience looking back at the industry and your experience in the industry, how do you see this playing forward? Uh, given your um, uh, experience and, and, and perspective, what would you uh, tell the Chinese government in terms of how they should be investing this money uh, in a way that could help the global industry, not just China's industry? Thank you. You know, China imports a lot of uh, raw materials, like oil and uh, minerals. And it turns out the biggest import dollar-wise are chips from US and other Japan, Korea. So they feel a need to reduce the dependence. So they feel they need a semiconductor industry. Uh, but a semiconductor industry is not just a fab. A fab is like a printing shop. The, all those new chips that command high value, the value is in the, is in the intelligence of the design. So building a chip industry is not to build those $7 billion plants, which is of this part of it. But the guts of that is not that. It's the design expertise, the algorithms, the imagination of the designers. Uh, that cannot be bought by money very well. You can buy hardware. But the smart expertise. Uh, so seven, $20 billion. Uh, just don't think about why, how much you couldn't. I think a fine material would like them to buy a lot of material. Uh, <laughs> but it's the, for example, the cell phone. I, I showed that chip from uh, Qualcomm. That's the gut of any of the Androids. All the technology in a cell phone is the expertise resides with those chip designers. Qualcomm, they don't even have their own fab. They just design and have other people to, to, to build them. Uh, so if they want to build companies like Qualcomm, or there's a company in, in Taiwan called a Microtech, they design the, the chip for all the low-cost Xiaomi and, and all those stuff. These are the, where the real value is. The other just making printing uh, factories. So, so the money has to be spent wisely. But not easy to duplicate those know-how in the system. How would it come from? Just for the record, uh, while uh, most of U.S. silicone does pass into China, and China's biggest import is 
chips, most of those chips make a U-turn to come right back out after they've been uh, put into other products, mostly by foreign companies. So um, it's, it's a, that, that, uh, that fact is kind of, kind of look, a little, little bit nuanced. Thank you. And I, and I think it's written about that and what the true trade balance is with China and China and China. China. And to your point, if, if application is so much of the future, uh, it seems like China would be better focusing more of their attentions there than instead of trying to build, as I understand, the, uh, the, the, the 3D NAND is, is a layer or a Samsung 64 layer. So in the Visa, the, the, the government officials can point out to this brand new factory and that's the accomplishment. Whereas you have a team of people who just listen from in front of the screen and design, the, the public will not appreciate that. But in fact, the value is very different. Let's take one more question, then we'll wrap it up. Gary Arlen from Arlen Communications. I loved your comments about media and government support and endorsement of, of technology and innovation development. I just wonder about two policy things that are you know, where, where we are right now. One is, in Gertner's great book about uh, the Idea Factory at Bell Labs, he, he really explained, I thought, very well how Bell Labs has a sweetheart agreement with the federal government. So all it was a separate private entity, uh, they, even, they got a Pentagon to delay the divestiture of, of the uh, break of the bell system because the Justice Department wanted to do it, the Pentagon had reasons to keep it alive. Uh, more recently, of course, right now we're looking at the uh, uh, the Apple FBI fight government and industry, a uh, different issue really, but do you want to talk at all, or does anybody want to talk at all about the policy relationships? Uh, industrial policy, anything that sort of comes from this that helps or more likely impedes uh, innovation. Stephen, but I, I do say the Bell Lab model, the old Bell Lab from the 30s to the late 60s, uh, even though it's a big organization, but really the research group is about 350 people, real elite, and they have done so much. Uh, they have stable funding, which government help them a lot, tremendously. And yet, there's internal pressure, and they have, they claim that the telecom is a problem-rich environment. There are so many great problems to, to focus your energy to solve. Uh, in today's level, for example, NIH level, or whatever, actually, it's, it's, it's opportunity-rich. There are so many things you can do, but can we create something like the old Bell Lab, like the startup of like a Fairchild, if you can do that, bam, things will take off. Right. And so these are things maybe worthwhile for policy people to think about. Yeah, that's a, that's a very tough. That's a very tough one to contemplate. Uh, it's, a, it's a complicated one because, um, in general matter, our our government uh, steers away from industrial policy. And Bell Lab was uh, existed in a snapshot in time in American history. I think returning to that and the um, surrounding environment would be impossible in this, in this environment. Not just political environment, but we just don't do um, industrial policy on the face of it. And that's, frankly, that's one of the challenges we have in so many other sectors, not just the southern sector, sector as we uh, tackle the China challenge. Because China does do industrial policy. The Japanese did industrial policy, semiconductors, and many other sectors in the 70s and 80s, but we're open, market-driven economy, largely, and we're like Swiss cheese. Uh, and so it's very hard to come up with policy response uh, um, to uh, a country that's uh, driving uh, very focused, well-funded industrial policy. Now, we did that with the Japanese, the semiconductor sector did that with the Japanese in the 80s. Um, and, but they were different levers then. Uh, it was a different play. So it's a, great to have a, a Bell Lab kind of solution, but I just don't think we're gonna be able to return to that particular solution. But we do need that kind of research going on. Well, let me make a couple points here, and we'll wrap it up. Um, first, I mean, what's clear uh, throughout the book, especially in the past half century in this country, was massive amounts in investment in scientific research. Now, certainly part of that came through the taxpayer, which actually had a line item on the phone bill, which actually you paid a tax directly to the labs. But also part of that was significant federal funding for scientific research, particularly channeled through universities, which of course, you know, led to Stanford and you know, 
Francisco and three of all these companies came directly out of federally funded university research. And we're not investing enough today. Uh, if our federal government invested as much in scientific research today as a share of GDP as it did in 1983, we invest $60 billion more a year. We wouldn't have to cluster cutting 12% a year. So first order is we gotta increase the federal funding in scientific research as John talked about. Well, one point actually didn't come in the, in the book explicitly, but what goal of the uh, NDEA, the National Defense Education Act, because it was really uh, the, the, the training uh, program we had to bring a lot of scientists and engineers into our society as part of the Cold War. Um, what was a key part of our ability to compete in these technology industries. So more focus on talent, number two. But the third and final thing, I think, uh, with regard to the point you made, John, about pre-competitive research, which is vitally important, not only for the manufacturing industry, but for all advanced, uh, uh, advanced uh, uh, manufacturing product and process technologies. And that's exactly why the Obama administration has spearheaded the creation of this National Network for Manufacturing Innovation, the NNMIs. Uh, these are to be, you know, institutes of manufacturing excellence that are the, 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 that are hotbeds or testbeds uh, that are platforms for pre-competitive research to bring scientists and engineers and students and technologists and firms and, and uh, uh, you know small businesses and states and regions together, uh, focused on key specific technology areas like we talked about earlier in Japan. And so I think what has been missing in the technology innovation ecosystem of the United States for the past 20 years has been these types of platforms. And I think uh, scholars will look back you know, half a century from now and say that this was uh, the thing that we did most in the early part of the century uh, to really rebuild the technology innovation ecosystem in the United States in these different lives. So I hope that they continue to enjoy professional support and administration support going forward. If there's one thing that we've done very well as, as a nation in the last 50 years, it's research and development. Segment of industry itself uh, pours more of its sales back into R&D than any other sector in the U.S. Probably 20% of our sales are plowed back into R&D. And if we're going to stay on the te te technological tip of the spear in the semiconductor sector or others, we need to continue to do that and uh, and wrap it up, particularly when it comes to uh, government funding. Just just make one more comment. It's government funding that many types. Personally, I feel there's an agency called DARPA. Their way of funding real breakthrough technology is uh, quite outstanding. And they have a uh, critical thinking process, so-called a uh, higher moral catechism, used how to evaluate uh, breakthrough ideas. It's a, it's a very good critical thinking path for, for mm -hmm. researchers to kind of uh, shape their ideas. So that model is it deserves a lot of credit. Yeah, and I think we have to top that model. We have to model where uh, government creates a fertile soil in which innovators and entrepreneurs in the private sector can bring new technologies. Well, with that, uh, Derek, it's been a fantastic presentation, a fantastic conversation. I want to thank you and our audience for staying with us. And uh, 